in our witness presentation. And then finally, at the end, skip the witness presentation. And after that, we'll have a general discussion. May I ask Simon to come in front so that he will have his presentation? Simon, please, you are around. Two 
two different samples, 10 grams and 20 grams. Now, the data were collected on a weekly basis for the population. And at first week, or second week rather now, we, for control, control recorded about 300 population of the termites in the graveyard, while treated with Odoranta, Jupitala, and Jebukas, recorded less than uh, 50. Well, Jebukas, Jebukas recorded the least because of its uh, effect on the population, followed by Odoranta and uh, Jupitala. There's also significant difference between the traits, between the pesticide plants and the, uh, the, the samples used. The that trend was found at third week after application, and it shows an increase in population. There, there is a significant increase based on the duration of uh, this data collection. On treated here, the record is about 450. While treated, as uh, treatments carry the Toronto, Jupitala, and Jebukas, the record is less than 10. For Jebukas, it was significant for basically no uh, termites found in graveyards treated with Jebukas. Similar threat was found as uh, four weeks after planting. Yes, 
So essentially you've got an effect for whenever there's cardio in present, and no effect when there's no cardio in present. So the, how do you disentangle the effect of the cardio in and the effect of the pesticide in past? Um, actually, uh, it is recorded as cardio and also contained uh, insecticidal property. The reason behind the addition of this cow urine was to like, increase the efficacy of the uh, pesticide. Although another experiment would be conducted where the actually on the use of seed, where there will be addition of cow urine probably and you allow the other without cow urine being introduced so that you cannot compare the trumpet forms to it, whether with cow urine or without. And I'm intrigued to see how, how the cardio and the pesticide parts work independently, so how the trial strategy get them together. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I also made an addition to what uh, the printer speaker is saying. I had a concern on the, on the treatment because the urine is not standing out. But if it was the one that had the ultimate effect, then the botanic agents were themselves did it. So that isolation of that compounding variable was not what really separated. And then at the same time, I'm concerned on this, uh, this cow even, uh, what with this cattle feeding, cows feeding one, could it be possible that uh, when they are given different diet treatments, these cows will produce some urine that have a better effect. So, so to, to me, that, 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 that all those questions that are coming in to say, okay, there is a cow urine, but the, the cow is producing that urine as a result of what? Of the process of the cleaning business. It's a It's a It's a skin to be out. So definitely what the cow eats may determine also what is in the urine. So maybe that would be an interest also to look at. Yes, thank you so much. Actually, uh, I've been a publication which I come across. It's not just the car urine that is used as uh, maybe one of the materials added to this office. You can also use human urine. But it was difficult for us to collect urine from humans as well for a reasonable number of times. So what was really available at the time of this trial was the car. So we decided to make do with that. Right, and suppose uh, now all the results are excellent, uh, urine is working very well and all that. Let's look at uh, the operational side of things. Uh, how, how do you see this uh, uh, work? How do you see this happening? You know, A to A control of uh, pests, uh, especially considering the possible competition between. Uh, probably the pesticide of properties and the, uh, the fertilizer side of things because also fertilizer is becoming quite expensive and uh, there's always been a, a wish to explore uh, you know, collection of uh, different sources, you know, it's high in urea uh, and many times you know, it's not cheap to produce our own fertilizers.
Uh, and also wondering if you can do any feature space since you can feel this way. And why do you not use a chemical thermicide? Uh, Just to make it more possible. If you want to sell or not, then you should use it. And so I the second part of the experiment will happen. Thank you, sir. Well, let's, let's give you more time. Uh, 
tobacco is, is prohibited. So I think as researchers also need maybe to come up with a, uh, a quick solution uh, to this industry so that they can survive using these uh, eco-friendly uh, mechanisms for economic pests. Thank you.
to actually assist them in terms of uh, measuring the pH and uh, checking all the residues of all the residues after a certain uh, period. Because if you maintain them at a lower pH, uh, they actually uh, get uh, very depleted. I, I would like to uh, respond to uh, Bill Stevenson's question about is it better to uh, sell um, chilies or to use them for pests. In the case of West Kenya, uh, the area where we're working, uh, you can get a kilo of chilies, dried, dried chilies, for about a pound. And I think on that basis, much better used as a fertilizer, although the farmers, of course, want to sell them. Uh, uh, much, sorry, much better used as a pesticide. So, to answer your question. Thank you very much for the presentation and congratulations for the efforts so far for your specific grants. Um, I was checking the pictures of when the spray was being done. Looks like it's in the afternoon here is where I wanted to comment something that spray should better be done in the evening or in the absence of sunlight sunlight because uh, compost from plants do break up easily in the presence of sunshine. So a better timing for spray should be either in the morning or in the evening, but preferably in the evening. Because that is connected to light and no such shape. Thank you. Can we now have now this presentation, please? activities. It is a highly uh, has been shown from 
the high variability in terms of its secondary metabolites. And uh, I have uh, attached, sorry, sorry. Just a moment, I had a hyperlink to the same. Now 
Now uh, we have, uh, I have given the outline, uh, the biological activity uh, where this plant has uh, a director chromium, which are the crocosine one and two. These ones have been seen to have a lot of uh, anti-insecticidal anti activities, especially with regard to the storage beetle. So all those the highlighted in green are the main, main, the main uh, tests which have been, or insects that have been able to be uh, acted upon by this kind of a plant. If you go down, I've also shown Technology is good, but at times uh, can cause stress. So as an insect, particularly when you are trying to learn some of these trees, as an insect, you can see that the, the petroleum extract has been used against the, uh, when you apply the green, uh, the green gum, it has worked uh, for, to control how we will over a period of 10 years. Uh, the volatile oil also exhibited uh, uh, insectivity activity against the weevil, and you can see the sexual oil at some uh, rate has also shown about 97 percent mortality in the adult uh, cow weevil. So much of the work that has been done in uh, the coast around the, the cow weevil can also see the hexene extract that has caused. Uh, 100% uh, mortality for the Vanya. Uh, we have uh, uh, a case where it has been used in an intercrop system uh, in citrus and it has been shown to enhance predatory mites that the amnesia species and this has been uh, seen to be working as a natural enemy against the Panomlichas citri. And uh, uh, the toxicity has also been shown against the cotton strainer and many other uh, tests, as you can see, highlighted in this. Uh, I would also wish to go through the, some of the unicidal cases uh, uh, that have been uh, addressed by this, as you can see. We have uh, some activity against Fusaria muscispora, Phytophthora cystrophora, Phytophthora Fusaria solani, and many others as we, we proceed down, and as I have said, this is impacted by the various uh, different compounds that are present in that uh, uh, weed. Tricosine 2 has also been found to inhibit the tricosine. Uh, that is mycotoxins uh, that are, are, are present as caused by the serum granulera. So, uh, there are many others that uh, we, can, we can see as a result of the precocin. We also have seen a concentration of 6% of the plant extract of the aerial parts, significantly reducing the biomass of Fusarium solani. The crude extracts have also been uh, worked for uh, Citrotrella and also uh, on uh, Idemonella Premiane and several others as uh, we go down. And I uh, also wish to look at the, the use as a nematicide. So, this is the herbicidal and the nematicidal, and I wouldn't want to dwell much on this because uh, my, I would uh, not have done well if I hadn't looked at the research gaps. So I quickly go through the research gaps. So uh, through the, 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 the review, I was able to pick a few major issues. 
I know it has been a concern of all of us that uh, some of these products we apply on the, uh, the food products and at the end of the day they have been shown to have uh, some toxic effects like uh, we not out that the, the presence of alcohol in that frequency 1 and 2 in Adirakan conjoids has generally been shown to have not general true, a lot of research shown to have some toxicity in rats, and uh, at some point, uh, there is need that before it is applied on stored grains, we should be able to determine how uh, uh, the extent to which it can cause hepatotoxicity or general toxicity to humans. We can also look at, uh, you can see most of the, the work has been done on the storage test. There is also a gap uh, for research on, on, on the crop pests uh, when the crop is in the field. Uh, the findings by Ong indicated that the level of allelochemicals and allelopathic potential depends upon the growth scale and type of habitat. And yet there is very little that has been done on that, so we could also explore, because much of what has been documented is on uh, the allelopathy in the field, as in if the, the, the Adirakam is growing as a a pet, uh, as a, a weed, then it, exhib, it, it prevents the growth of other weeds. Would wish to know uh, how the type of habitat and also the state of growth impacts that allelopathy potential. Then, uh, other studies also indicated that the, the, the allelochemicals work in synergy, and uh, therefore the allelopathy potential is intensified if you expose the, the, the weed to various environmental stresses and therefore I want to imagine this would uh, include the, the, the agronomic the practices and also the, the climatic condition that can cause uh, several levels of stress to the plant. And there, the last one is that uh, they have several effects have been shown mainly in party production systems. So can there be an exploitation of the same on other crop production systems? Thank you for listening to me. The floor is open. Just out of interest, I have just seen a picture and seen club, club familiar to me. If you come across any literature, it will show somebody it is a fit to, to read it. If I'm not mistaken, I think some pharmacies that we use that plant to feature it. Yeah, I would uh, say that uh, uh, when I was assembling, the, I have uh, I'm a horticulturist and uh, I intended to have a bias to crop production. But I've seen it uh, in limited literature on its use as a, a, an animal feed, not necessarily on rabbits. Any question or comment? Okay, let's give a, a hand. Thank you so much. Then finally, I uh, will have a presentation for Steve.
as a as I can. She should be able to finish up a little bit in advance of schedule. So uh, when I was approached to do the library here, I was thinking maybe to talk about uh, sort of field crop management. And you will now see we're, we're moving into the arena of post harvest management. So I've sort of advised uh, to talk a little bit to try to bridge across both activities. So I'll talk a little bit about post harvest research as well as some uh, field crop research. And all of this research is, is really going to be uh, done in the context of a McKnight Foundation project. So those of you who aren't familiar with McKnight Foundation, they're an American charity, uh, and they've done quite a lot of research here in Africa. They have uh, different regional teams, so they've done research in West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. And the project that I'm going to be telling you about is, is in the Southern African region. You can see a lot of the names here that are involved in this project. You've already heard a little bit about this project with <laughs> Angela McKinney, who gave her talk earlier today on some of the field uh, crop aspects. So I'm going to, first of all, uh, talk about some of the post harvest. And just to sort of give you an idea of where we're working, so here is sort of an map of East Africa, by Tanzania and Malawi here, and we're collaborating with Nelson Mandela, Institute of African Institute of Science and Technology at Arusha, which is right before, very near Mount Kilimanjaro and Arusha. And we're also working with the Longway University of Natural Resources, which is just, just a little bit south of the Longway. And we're, we also have uh, Gibbys Tenbo uh, here from the from the Longway University. She'll be talking, I think, at the very end of the conference. So uh, thank you, Gibbys, for taking that last slot. So this is a, a project, kind of a big project. project. It's coming up to, to the, near the end of its uh, phase. We're hoping to get more funding out of it. Most of what McKnight tries to do within all the projects it funds is to very much work with farmers. So most of our activities are very strongly focused on farmer participation, farmers doing this research alongside with us. But it can't just be that. We do need to fast off that sort of farmer work by understanding chemistry and developing what we hope are perhaps novel applications for some of these pesticide plants. So some of it is about proving that these things really work in the field with our involvement, but then also looking at how we can actually optimize the, the way these uh, things are actually used in practice. So, one of the things that uh, we wanted to look at, particularly in a post-harvest context, one of the way most farmers use these things traditionally is they add mix in some sort of pesticide or plant material. So they make a powder and they stir that into their stored grain beans or maize, whatever it is, it's some sort of powder that they're not mixing in. And then, of course, when we're talking about health and safety issues, we, that sort of raises some concerns because this is food that is going to be consumed and they somehow have to remove all that powder. There are worries about uh, toxicity, which we've all been talking about already. So one of the things that we wanted to look at is can we actually reduce exposure by perhaps not actually mixing in the grain with the, with the commodity? Is there some other method? that we could use. So, so this is just trying to illustrate what we need. What we're talking about double bagging is that we put our commodity inside a bag like this. So imagine that's full of cow pee. And then around that bag, we're adding our plant materials. So it's not actually being mixed in the grain at all. And that goes inside another bag. So the plant material is between two bags, and the commodity is clean inside. So we just wanted to see, well, does this work? We had some sort of anecdotal information that maybe some farmers actually do do this, but we really wanted to test it in a way. So this, was, this wasn't actually done as a farmer trial, this was done as a laboratory trial, so that we could actually control the conditions, and you can see we had mixed uh, treatments versus this new sort of double bag treatment, and we also had some positive negative controls, and you can see the different four plant species that we were using there. So this was put in a room where we were hoping for natural infestation to occur. So these, uh, these uh, cow feces were certified clean at the beginning. And then you've got these buckets scattered around the room, which were infested, heavily, heavily infested. So this room was, had a very high infestation pressure, and there was lots of insects flying around. And the idea is that they have to infest these treated bags that are this sort of randomly put around the room. Both admixed and double bagged. 
So I believe these will be different colors to see, but I will try to show you the main fix for that. Because this is, first of all, just looking at the number of events made by the reviewers. And so this first graph is looking at when the treatments are at. So this is putting the plant material powder, fixing it in the brain. And then this graph over here is when the treatments between the bags, the double bag. And down here, there's a number of different treatments of positive and negative controls of plant materials. And so the blue line here, it is the tetrahydrin of the and the red line is the synthetic, commercial synthetic pesticide, metallic. So actually, tetrahydrin performed better than the commercial synthetic, but more or less, they both worked. They both kept down for the, the number of eggs being made. All the other treatments, including the untreated, really had no effect. And that's very much seen over here again. This is the, the, the double bagging. The other pesticides really didn't work. The other one that works was tetrahydrin, which is very comparable to the commercial synthetic metallic. It's the same thing really can be seen if you go through all those bags, count the number of live adults, again tetrosia, very few adults, the other treatments are really no different from the untreated. And there's no surprises here, the number of dead adults, also this is almost the same trend. And finally, the number of versions holds. So you would expect all those things to autocorrelate, so it's no great surprise here. But what it does show is Two things. Unfortunately, many of the lab treatments we tried had no effect on it. Small cases of invasion pressure into our clean brain. However, Tifrosi did. And so Tifrosi worked really well, and also it worked just as well when it was double bagged. So it does show, at least if you get the right plant material there, there's opportunities for using this technology of reducing the, the idea of having to mix in the, the treatment with the brain itself. So it's something that I think we need to look into more once the first time we've done this, and we need to see how practical this is, particularly in the farm levels. This was done, of course, remember, as a sort of station trial. So we will be looking at this a little bit more. So this is just trying to, again, summarize what I've just said. Tecrosia works just as well as synthetic. The other treatments really didn't. And one of the key issues, I think, when it comes to brain storage of all aware of is this is working in context without any infestation already in the brain. And this often doesn't happen naturally with farmers did when they're bringing in their grain from the field, it already has some sort of pre infestation in there. So this does have to be combined in some other way, for example, solarization, to make sure you're putting in completely infestation free grain at the very beginning. So moving on to some other trials, so this is uh, again moving more to the farmer to just for the nature of the work we've been doing it, right? So this is work that's been done with Goody's Tempo and the long way, looking at uh, storing beans on, at the farm level and having farmers uh, doing the trials for us and alongside with us, with working with us to, to evaluate the different materials again in this context. So here you can see the same species will be mixed at a rate of 1%, so this is that mixing in a powder, as well as our positive and negative controls in there, and farmers had four different sacks for different treatments in it so that we could uh, make up the, the, the number of replicates. So this is work that was done a couple of years ago. So you can see this is a, the score sheet from 2014 to 2015. And again, this is kind of a complicated graph. But what you can see here, well, these are the months of storage. So this is stored over an eight-month period. And then you have the different colored treatments down here. So the positive controls, the synthetic, it is the one that has the lowest number of lines of sex, as you would expect. The synthetic has worked pretty well. The red line here is the untreated. So this is with no treatment at all, and the number of lines of sex is going up quite dramatically. Then in between are our are, are pesticide plant treatments. So you can see the, the, the lines that fit through there, these are the straight line correlations. They have a pretty good fit for the most part. So I think the data shows that these pesticide plant treatments can work. They don't work as well as the synthetic, but they work better than doing nothing at all. And this is just the same sort of data, the data again, this is looking at mean damage. So this is the damage rate to the stored beans, and very much reflects the same thing. Again, we have the synthetic at the bottom, the untreated control at the top, and our pesticide plant treatments are in between us somewhere. Pretty much all of the press, this is worth it. This uh, is not really finish yet. We only have the first six months of data here. But it's, a, it's, a, it's the same sort of setup again. And then we have quite different results here, which is 
a lot of the, the fantastic bubbles of joy fields of certain flowers. It doesn't always come out the same result, even though you're repeating it exactly in the same way. So here again, we have our, our untreated control, which is very, very different. But in this case, all of our plant traits are really uh, in working just as well as the synthetic. So they're all very, very similar there, you can see. And again, if you look at that, that size, it says the damage slightly spread out a bit again, but still slightly more promising results there that these pesticide treatments were working almost as good as the, as the synthetic control. So again, trying to, to, to understand what's going on here, there is some sort of inter-annual variability here. One of the things I'm highlighting is how important this is, is we keep your work over more than one season to see if it, you do get consistent results like this. So I mean, it, it, what we have to say is you're doing nothing. Farmers are losing quite a high percentage of their needs. And at least some of the data suggests that these pesticide plants are dramatically reducing that, that damage rate over a long storage period. So the, the, this is just again trying to highlight that working with farmers to generate this sort of data can uh, sort of convince the farmers themselves that this is worthwhile doing. Okay, now I'm going to sort of move more of what I was originally intended to talk about, and that's sort of field pest management out in the field, particularly um, what, what we've been learning. Not so much about the, the efficacy of control, but trying to take our work a bit further to understand the economics of this, looking at some of the access to services in this. Angela talked about this a little bit in her talk, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. But one of the other things that was very important to this my project was to come up with sort of training materials or coming up with a way of actually giving a standard book. We're only not talking about this here in the meeting. What, what's the best way of using these things? We're all worried about inherent variability, whether that's geographic variability, climatic variability, seasonality, variation. All of these things are important, but when it comes down to the end of it, a farmer has to do with what he's got. So he's going to have a number of plant materials growing around in his environment. And I think we can standardize that method to some extent. And that's, I think, what we've been trying to do, working with farmers to train them up to understand what is a simple, straightforward methodology, regardless of what plant materials you have, that you can treat them all more or less the same way, and they'll get a level of control from that. We can't necessarily say how good that control will be, but by using a standard method, it makes it a bit easier for a farmer, I think, to understand what the limitations, what are the sort of really important aspects. So we talked about some of these things already. So for example, shade drying material. We don't want uh, our harvested materials to be out in the sun because the sun can break them down. The farmers themselves have mentioned this is important. But once you've collected it, it's all dry, you want to store it also in a dark, dry situation so that it doesn't degrade. But what we also, we also recommend is that you should grind it immediately. If you're going to store it, store it as whole plant material. That may be very bulky, but when you grind it, you're opening up oxidation potential. All those sort of extra powdery surfaces are going to more uh, rapidly break down the active ingredients in there. So you really don't want to grind it right before you're ready to use it. So this, the, the other reason for, of course, grinding it down to a fine powder is that will increase the extraction rate. So I think this is also another issue that's come up, is if it's not ground properly, the surface area available to extract the compounds is much, much reduced. So this is a challenge for farmers, and I think this is where we can try to advise them on what technology is, is best to get the finest powder. The pounding is very, very laborious. You then have to sit it and pound it again. I've seen it done. It takes a lot of work. So we do need to think about what technology, simple grinders, that uh, can be put into that sort of middle tier that Murray was talking about at the sort of community level. If it has a central grinder, even if it's a hand grinder, it would really facilitate this process of making a, a much better extract than what they've been used to. So and then when the actual process comes to making the extract, you want to really make that up sort of 24 hours in advance. So the day before, you want to put it into water. And again, we, we, you know, people talk about what's the right concentration to use? Is it 1%, 10%, 20%? I think, in our city experience, there's not much point in going below 1% if you're making some sort of field uh, extract that's what you're going to put on your field crops. In maybe in some situations, you could go lower than that. But we would also say there's not much point in going much higher than 10%, because some people have already realized if you try to make a solution higher than 10% with a finely ground plant material, there's not enough water there to extract the plant beans that you put into there. 
So I would say anywhere between one and ten percent are valid concentrations to try, and then you do need to perhaps uh, standardize that itself when working with farmers. And then of course after you've made this extract 24 hours, you're going to apply it, uh, put it in the field. We would also say add it so always put a bit of soap in there. It's going to aid extracting the, the more hydrophobic compounds that are going to be in there. It's also going to act as a surfactant when the farmers go to spray it in their fields. And we've, we've all, always been talking about this idea of residues as well. I mean, there's quite a lot of research on this already. The half-life of bean, the half-life of rotenum is those. We can know this for a number of different crops. It's in the literature. You can go find this out, but you will find out it is very, very quick. It's probably too quick for, for most farmers. Within 24 or 48 hours, so all these compounds will have completely disappeared in the field. So we work in the of residues. We've tried to do some research to find the residues ourselves, but we can't find them. Using chemical analyses and HPLC and all these things to detect the residues is a huge challenge because they break down so quickly because there's nothing in there to help uh, stabilize these compounds when they're extracted in this sort of natural way. The other thing, because of that very rapid breakdown, farmers have to understand they can't just apply it once and expect their problem to be solved the way they may have been using a synthetic pesticide. They're going to have to repeatedly apply a natural product like this to keep locking down the pest population with each application. So we could go into this sort of all training exercise a lot more, but I, I think there are some things we can say that we can have a sort of very standard, in, in a general sense, this sort of application will work with whatever sort of type of species and however that has been collected. So now I just want to talk about some of these sort of economic and ecological aspects. So this is a paper, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this paper that was recently published in POS1. POS1 is an open access journal, so you can all get a hold of this paper very easily. And I just want to try to pull out some of the information from that to try to really bring home that these materials are cost beneficial, they're very environmentally beneficial as well. So we follow this sort of standard method, we put soap in, but we wanted to do this in a scientific way, so we did soap before extraction, after extraction, putting soap or no soap, for example. So we had quite a lot of controls with uh, you know, all these negative controls as well as the synthetic control. And then we assessed these on a, on a weekly basis, looking at the number of insects, the damage, and of course at the end, looking at the, at the yield that come out of these uh, field needs. So we were looking for certain key insect species only. We weren't counting every kind of insect that was possibly out there. We focused on what are called foliage beetles, flower beetles, or sister beetles, you'll know them by aphids, and then a number of different predatory species, so maybe there are spiders, or hoverflies, to, to get some idea of what predators were out there. And then also looking at, of course, the dynamics of the plant itself, so its growth, its yield, and the number of balls and seeds. So this is just showing Priscilla Pekna. She was uh, one of the students involved in this work. She's now doing her PhD with us on other aspects of this work. And so here she is out assessing the, the, these trials of bean fields. And then, of course, the, all these different pods were harvested. And she went through meticulously counting pods and seeds per pod to, to understand the yield from these trials. So this is just showing uh, abundance of the insects and predators now. So the colors here, so you've got at the top, you have aphids, foliage beetle, flower beetle, and then the last two here are predators. So we have ladybirds, lady beetles, and spiders. And then on the bottom here, we have the different plant materials. We have Lipia, Tephrosia, Tephonia, Vernonia, the control not treated, and then the control synthetic. So you can see the synthetic kills lots of things. And the plant treatments are so different from the untreated controls. So they are re reducing the number of, of, of insects there. If you say look at like aphids here, but that's the, that's the, sorry, that's the lady blue, lady blue beetles there. If you look at aphids, which is the first bar, certainly there is a reduction there. And then looking at the predators, there really it is, hasn't been that reduction. So that's one of the things I want to come back to, this aspect where they're killing off our pests, but they seem to be leaving alone our predators. Which is, which is good news. So that, now this is just looking at the damage now. So no predator information here, just our aphids, foliage beetles, flower beetles. You can see damage is relatively high on the untreated. It's very low on the synthetic. And then our pesticide, our four different 
species with pesticide plant or somewhere in between there. And then uh, finally, yeah, this is the, again, looking at the sort of uh, damage. So here, this is where we have the score there. And again, you can see the same sort of trends, the synthetics are quite low, the other tree is quite high, and our pesticide plants are somewhere in between there. So what we did to take this further is to try to understand what are the input costs of using a pesticide plant versus using a synthetic. So a lot of the costs, of course, are common no matter what you're doing. So for example, you need seeds, fertilizer, you need to prepare the land, you need to weed. So those are common to all treatments. But some treatments, uh, say the synthetic, so if you the cost of the synthetic, that is only going to be unique to the synthetic treatment. So it's quite a high cost there. But that's not to say that pesticide plants have no cost. They don't have to be bought, but they do need to be collected and ground. So there's a labor cost to using a pesticide plant. So that's what we wanted to try to capture. We used sort of ordinary sort of labor charges to work out what are the costs of doing some of these things in terms of labor to make this a sort of comparative assessment. So this is trying to show you that what is the benefit. So in this first column here, we have the overall yield. So this is the, the, the mean yield from our different treatments. So we have the negative control, the positive control, and then our four benefit treatments here. So you can see the negative control we have treated has quite a low yield, so 1,200. And uh, the positive control, the synthetic, has a very high yield, 1,500 or so. But also, the, the synthetic, uh, the pesticide of plants also have very high yields. In fact, some of the yields are higher than the synthetic treatment. So based on these uh, yield numbers, we can then work out what is the marginal rate of return. Marginal net return and marginal rate of return. So these are based on these input costs and on a per hectare basis of growing these things. So what you can see there is, if you look at this row right here, the marginal rate of return, this is US dollars per hectare. The negative control, the untreated, has a return about $4 per hectare. The synthetic control also has a return of about four dollars per hectare. It does have a higher yield, so they, they will make more money that must be untreated. And then if you look at the rate of return using the pesticide plants, it's much higher. It's about five, five and a half dollars per hectare. That's because they haven't had to spend the money to buy the synthetic pesticide. So if you then compare these in relation to the untreated control, you can see the rate of increase. So I mean, the synthetic certainly is better than doing nothing, but the, using particularly some of the pesticide plants here, it really does improve the benefit to the farmer in terms of money in their pocket. So that's one of the one message that we really want to get across with uh, this work. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to this boss one paper. So this is uh, just trying to summarize, I think, some of the important parts there. One of the things that we would like to pull out of that is it's, it's cost beneficial, but also it's environmentally beneficial. So the synthetic is killing everything, it's killing the natural enemies, it's killing pollinators, whereas our pesticide plants, they are having an impact, but it's at a much lower rate, and it allows those predators to then perhaps kind of mop up and, and contribute to the level of pest control in our treatments. So now just moving really on to some uh, other research that we've been since that paper came out, it was then looking at some of these other issues, for example, on cropping and intercropping. Angela briefly mentioned this in her talk, because there, again, people think about if you intercrop things together, you're improving biodiversity, you're perhaps reducing pest pressure because the insects might get confused there. So we did want to look into this aspect, particularly in the context of access to services. Is monocropping worse or better than intercropping? And intercropping is usually maize and maize beans together. A lot of farmers do this simply because the beans help fix nitrogen to supply to the maize crop. So that's probably the overriding reason why farmers do that. But we, we might be able to argue that there are other benefits for doing uh, an intercrop versus a monocrop. So this was done with farmers, and here you can see Nelson Kumi, which is another student, and he's, these are farmer fields here where he's going out doing, doing inspections uh, with the different treatments that have been out there working with the farmers themselves. And this was done very much the same sort of uh, methodology that I've just shown you from the boss paper. We're only using 10% extracts, this is with farmers, and then doing the same sort of assessments in the field. So here again, you can see a similar slide to what Angela showed you. This is an earlier day. We have our pests over here, so we have 
aphids, beetles, flower beetles, foliage beetles, and then predators, so yeah, hoverflies, lace wings. Obviously, there are many more uh, pest species than there are predators. And this makes it a little bit hard to pull out, but the first bars here, as you see, particularly the ones that are very high, these are the untreated controls. So that's a negative control, a control that's just with water, a control that's with water and soap, and then the, the yellow bar, which is here, that's our synthetic. So that one often is quite low here compared to those first ones. And then after that comes our, again, the sort of end of each series here are our societal plants, which are, some, again, somewhere in between these. So the, this is uh, looking at uh, an intercropped maize. Uh, so I should have pointed out this one before. It was monocropped up at here at the top. And this one is intercropped, the same sort of data, the same sort of trends. Really hard to pick apart what's, uh, if there's any difference there. So again, this is looking at the data by monocropped here. So we have our different controls. You can see very high uh, levels of insect damage in our, un our sort of untreated controls, these first three bars. We have our positive control, very low damage, and then our pesticide plant treatments are somewhere in between there. And this correlates quite well with the yield. So the blue bars are the damage, the little orange circles are the yield that's coming off this side here. So you can see the yield here is lower because damage is higher. But if you look at the control synthetic, versus our plant treatments. There's not a huge difference. Statistically, these are the same. Statistically, these are the same. So the pesticide plant treatments are working just as good as the uh, commercial synthetic, even though the damage is slightly higher. And it's the same sort of trend again with the intercropped. So very high damage plant treated. Damage is lower than synthetic, but its yield isn't really any different than our pesticide plant treatments. So conclusions for farmers. I think that this is, you know, we're all working towards this aim of trying to help farmers. So I think, you know, one, we do have to convince farmers. A lot of farmers aren't convinced that these things work. They're not sure how to use them. But we have evidence that we can go to them and say, process level plants are certainly better than doing nothing. If you do untreated controls, you're going to get a low yield. And you can, if you're happy with a low yield, that's, that's OK. But by putting just a little bit more input into that, you can get very high. Very high is comparable to if you went out and bought a commercial synthetic without getting all those extra costs of doing so. So, the economics of using pesticide plants is really quite convincing, I think. And that's the sort of evidence we need to, to work with farmers to show them that it is an economic benefit to do this. And then also, we can say that they're ecologically more sustainable, too. I think there's a, there's a lot more work that we're trying to do at this angle to look at what access to services are being uh, assisted. Uh, they're using pesticide plants. We know they're not as toxic to a lot of these beneficial organisms that might be out there. But that does mean that these pesticide plants can be more easily integrated with all sorts of other integrated pest management uh, tools to try to really uh, you know, get to this global agronomic ecological sustainability so that we can control our pests. We don't need to keep increasing the land, the size of the land of cultivation to increase the yield. But the farmers, we need to know that these aren't perfect. Pesticide plants are not perfect solutions. As our data shows, they're never quite as good as the commercial synthetic. They're often nearly there, but the damage will be high. They won't assist as Murray is pointing out, they may not be killing the insects, they may be repellent or anti feeding. So farmers really need to reassess how they do their uh, observations. You know, they're, they're quite used to the commercial synthetic is going off and killing everything immediately. Now they have to adjust their perception. If they're going to use a pesticide plant, it's not going to just immediately kill everything. They may need to re repeatedly apply them. And so farmers do, do need to understand that. And I think part of that is they need to understand to do their own experimentation. We don't have all the answers. We probably never will have all the answers. So we know these are complex compounds, complex plants, with all these different variables. But I think we can simplify it for them. I think we can come up with simple, simple methods of application. So we can say, make a 10% solution. We're drying these, we let it extract overnight, apply it in the evening so that you get a good benefit overnight when the sun is out. And with those sort of basic ideas, they can then play around with some of these other methods or some of the variables, for example, when to collect the plant material or how best 
to do the extraction, how much soap to put in, all these little things. Let the farmers do that. We give them the overall guidance of what we think is the best practice, and then they can make their own comparisons with that. A lot of people already mentioned these sort of bottleneck issues already. I think there are, these are things that are challenges for us as scientists, as well as trying to get these things further out to market. I mean, there is a, a real issue to increase the supply of pesticide plant materials that are out there. We've already talked about all, all, all the sort of regulatory issues. I know we all have been, uh, wonder how to overcome some of those things. And I think one of the big challenges here in Africa is we have a lot of natural resources, but on the, on the business side, people have been very reliant on the importation of commercial synthetics. And it's about growing uh, local businesses to, to deal with that sort of mismatch. And that leads me to say thank you to the Knight Foundation, my partners, and of course, options for, for really running this conference. So, time for questions. Thank you so much, Steve. It's time for questions. Steve, I think the idea of involving the farmers to do the work is fantastic. Because in that discipline, just one question. Is it a valid study to I know which plants are used? Because if they have the feeling, it hurts in some way that, that the pros here is a better plant, the judgment may be uh, a bit uh, skewed. Uh, in addition to that, um, I've done quite a bit of experience in extraction. And by far, as you said, the most important factor is the hardness of the particle. That's extremely important. And I hear what you say, if you if you don't grind immediately, if you grind at later stage, you might you, I think it sounds makes a lot of sense to me, but if you have a container bottle with a screw cap in which you could save it, I think there's a very good opportunity if there could be a grinder available somewhere in the community for those for people to bring their plant material once it must be dry, it's not dry, you have major problems. Then grind it very fine and then go to store it uh, in, a con in a container. And what I'm also wondering, to leave it just overnight or for 24 hours without stirring, to me makes little sense. Because what we found in work that we've done, if it's finely ground and you stir it very quickly, within five minutes you reach equilibrium. Uh, but that's very big story very fine particles. And then, if you have high concentration, you can actually re-extract. Usually, it goes maybe about 80% the first round, then about 10%, 5%. But, uh, just the question of the grinding, and also the potential of having a centralized grinding and then straight the bottles. Yeah. yeah, thanks for all that. What, what I can say with our, with our farmer work is we do monitor what they're doing, and, and particularly with some of the research that Angela was showing is how the farmer rankings really match up with the scientific rankings. So the scientists are going out and doing insect counts alongside, well, doing it independently of what the farmers are doing. So what the farmers are ranking almost always matches up. I'm surprised how well their, their rankings match up with reality in that sense. But not always. There are some, all of the things that we need to find out what was going on there. That town Kamara, for example, had a slightly different ranking from what the reality was. They, if you try to blind it, I think it would be difficult because they all smell differently. They know it would be very hard to do that. But having said that, I don't think they, they are, I mean, from our evidence we collected, we can say that they are being quite unbiased in their judgments. And in that sense, I think they are able to. But the way we design this is not all farmers have all treatments. So each farmer would have, say, uh, three pack materials plus the controls, and they rank those. And every, Different farmers have different combinations. So I essentially build up a statistical matrix that allows you to then come up with a ranking across all the whole factors. So that helps in the blinding aspect of these, so they're not able to rank against all the different pesticide species that you're involved in. So it, it's, a, it's a concern that I think, you know, at least our data suggests it can be minimized in that sense. I mean, for the same reason, scientists could also have their fixations to frozen it is the best. That's the yeah, yeah. So with regards to you know, grinding material earlier, if, if it can be stored well, yes, I, I don't have too much of an objection to that. I mean, after all, there's herbarium specimens and cute gardens and other gardens around the world that have been there for hundreds of years, and you can 
extract the chemicals out of them, and they're still there. So, it, I mean, it, it, a lot of these chemicals, if they're inside the factory, they're still quite stable, particularly if they're not putting direct sunlight and moisture and all that. So, and that is one thing that we'd like to look at in the future is about commercialization of our farmers making plant powders and adding them up and, and selling it at that stage. So, sort of a crude powder that is then given to farmers and they go on to do the extraction, but at least the material has been bulked up, so the quality controlled and it's in the powder form already. And as long as that is done in, the, in a standardized way, I can see that being a way to, to get to the sort of community level to make that work. So, was there another question that you had? There's, of course. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. oh sorry. yes. I mean, it, we haven't really looked at that. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we said 24 hours because farmers can do it the day before and then just come back and we're certain to get a little bit enough time. I'm sure they could speed it up, and that's one thing we could consider if they wanted to do it on the day before, you know, on the day they're actually going to spray, they could do that bigger stirring and then be ready to apply right away. But that's just another variable that. Standardize of this trade off there. So we are we'll trying to make it as easy as possible. That's yeah. the other thing to bear in mind. And if you add more physical activity, it yeah, makes it less attractive. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, very nice. Steve, so uh, you've shown all your treatments, and uh, this is beautiful, rigorous experimentation. One of, the, one of the things I've seen over the years is uh, in India, especially, but also in Mexico. Uh, is mixtures of plant extracts, complicated mixtures of plant extracts. Uh, do you want to comment on the feasibility of extending these sorts of on-farm trials to binary and tertiary mixtures of plants, and if you would expect to see synergy? Yeah, I mean, I know we've done a lot of work, and we've tried to do some work ourselves on it. These sort of laboratory studies to understand if the synergy or just additive effects. And even if it's just additive, if you're, you know, if you're, we're not talking about commercial products now, we're talking about on farm use. If a farmer has a bit of tithonia and a bit of diabetes and a bit of tephrosia, why not mix them together? I mean, I had no objection to that, even if it's just an additive effect in order to get the concentration level so that they have a, instead of having a 0.5% extract, they have something that's 5% of different mix plants put together, there'll be some, you know, benefit of doing that. Because there may be different modes of actions in there by putting different things in there, knowing what are the differences in chemistry. So, I, I mean, I had no objection to going out to a farmer and telling him to do that. As long as we don't get too caught up in how this might affect further ideas of commercialization, where you would be making your job even harder to understand is there synergy or just additive effects there, and you know, the regulations are just going to be out the roof. But for farm, farm use, I think it's a perfectly valid thing to do. Um, thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, I was interested in many aspects of what you have uh, taught us. Uh, concerning the storage product best is double bagging. Um, since the material was free from insects at the time of uh, bagging, then what was the action of the plant material around? Did you find some insects dead already in there, or this was a prevention of the insects to come into contact with it? I think what's happening there, at least in the context of tetrose, we know in tetrose they're rotenoid compounds, and uh, Calciferuthus is particularly sensitive to the rotenoid. So in the context of tetrose, it's Deborah and tetrose as the main rotenoid compounds in there. So it'll just be pure exposure when they try to penetrate the bag they're being exposed to a, a very, for them, a very high level of, of toxicity. So whether that was around the bag or mixed into the bag, it's just that sort of contact uh, toxicity. I'd say you know that quite well, I think, from a lot of apps trials as well. They die very, very quickly when exposed to growth points. And then, what was a bit disappointed that none of the other bacteria have worked, but, you know, that's, that's science for you. It's sort of conditions with a very high uh, infestation pressure. It's just, they just, you know, they're overwhelmed. So perhaps at a lower infestation rate, a level that's more realistic, perhaps they would work a bit more effectively than that. We really just wanted to show what is the effect of double bagging versus that mixing. If we were to repeat this, we may want to vary the infestation pressure to see if that makes a, a, a difference in efficacy. So it's a contact insecticide, not volatile effect. Well, rotenoids don't volatilize 
very well. They're quite uh, large, stable compounds. Whereas in some of the other plant uh, species we were using, they are more volatile. And that, again, it didn't seem to have any impact. Other trials we've done which have suggest that they do work. So that there, a lot of it is about context. And some of those contexts are, again, it's about humidity. Lots of other variables that farmers themselves may have difficulty controlling when they're storing their grain. So pesticide plants, I don't think, are the, all the solution. I know we're moving into the symposium on post harvest. I think that there are real challenges that have nothing to do with pesticide plants and more to do with following good storage practice for how they have that on, on farm level. And concerning the, the field experiments uh, with athletes, um, the treatments, uh, how, how many times were the treatments done? Yeah, we, we spray them every week. That might seem like a loss, but what we were, again, we're trying to come up with a standard protocol. So we would do our insect assessments, our damage assessments, on, on the, the last day, and the next day we would spray again. And then the assessments were done, done on the last day and sprayed on a weekly basis. And that's another variable we could certainly try to optimize. Is weekly too much, or is it not enough? So I mean, you've you seen the results there. It really works on a weekly basis. Could you do it, say, once every two weeks? Would you still get a, a, a level of control that you're happy with? And this is the trade-offs. You know, if we start spraying less frequently, you're going to get higher damage. So you know, you have to let the need for a farmer. Maybe the efforts of spraying every week is too much. I mean, you know, these are things that we talk to the farmers about. And unfortunately, in some some situations, they're already spraying weekly with their commercial synthetics because they're just used to the sort of pattern they're spraying. The, the, all the commercial synthetics aren't working very well, they're adulterated, they're using the wrong sorts of things. So there, unfortunately, there's still a lot of pattern they're spraying that goes on without any monitoring at all, which we would really want to move away from, that people should only be applying when there's a need to apply. But I think the practice of plants is you don't you always need it, because you, you'll not have the population, but you don't remove everything. So there'll still be a residue population. If you leave it alone, it's just going to come back up again. So I think that with the pesticide plants, it's sort of a different attitude, that your different perception that you have to keep marking it down repeatedly in order to, to maintain the sort of the threshold of, of abundance. So I understand that the pesticide plants we have to be yeah. applied more frequently anyway. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless you want to go down the route of commercial commercialization and formulation. Where you start adding things in there that stabilize the compounds. I mean, that's something you consider. But if you're just using natural products, we know they're going to break down very quickly. You're just by oxidation or ultraviolet light, that most of these compounds break down very, very quickly. If you want it to last longer, then you're going to have to formulate to do that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, one, one area that uh, is still kind of a black box is the, is the, the shelf life of these uh, uh, plant materials, the cider plants. Especially considering the seasonality of some of these plants in relation to when you actually want to use them. Um, we, I think we need more illumination in that area. Although you have also, on the other hand, uh, mentioned that there are some plants that are stored in cube running gardens and they still extract uh, active ingredients and they're still effective. Um, and yeah, but under, under uh, you know, tropical conditions, I don't know the conditions under which those plants are kept in cube. But uh, like if it's a group of farmers who want to use these plants at some point later, I think it's important to be able to say if you store these uh, plant materials for six months, uh, they might uh, have to choose the efficacy. Because uh, this will also relate to ideas of uh, producing or bulking and uh, then probably you have these cottage industries that were mentioned by Murray in the, in the morning. Uh, if you're not going to get the right efficacy after some time of storage, uh, and, and I, I think there might be a difference also in terms of plants. Some are pretty stable, but some 
like we've always known that plant uh, materials, they, they also had great, very fast. Uh, if you think of the, the, the more aromatic plants that we have been looking at, this sort of uh, volatiles are going to dissipate. Something like osamum or, or lithia, you know those volatile compounds are going to be lost somewhat during the drying process. Some of those volatiles will still be trapped inside the plants, so as long as you don't grind it again. Now, historically, in, in, in the whole sense, you'll extend the shelf life. As soon as you grind them, if you, let, if you can't store them well, there is this whole problem that you're going to increase the, the rate of degradation. But I think a lot of it will come down to how well the farm can store it. We see in our own trials that even when we're trying to, to dry material out, if it doesn't get dry properly, it starts to go moldy on us. If we're the scientists trying to dry things out and do it in a, in a well, well done way. So you can imagine farmers are going to struggle with some of these issues as well about drying it and maintaining it in a good condition, even under high humidity. But as long as it's kept dry enough, they want to get molds and, and that will contribute to it. So that, that's a whole other field of research, I think, looking at how well some of these things last. We have done trials with some plant materials like Secure Daca. We've done trials in the past that show the plant material does last for at least a year. But you know, that's just one species. So we do need to look at that on a species by species basis, I think. Okay, thank you for that nice presentation. Uh, I was just making a follow-up on the herbal bagging and uh, um, with the stored uh, product tests. Uh, we've had many farmers ask, how long do we treat this and leave it? So when I saw your kind of double bags, I was thinking like in Kenya we have these uh, bags which have plastic, which are lined up with plastic. So I was imagining probably if somebody did something on that, probably it would maybe perform better. Um, the other thing I was asking is, I saw that the experiments were running for like eight months, so would it be safe if like, they use that kind of uh, helper just to leave the grain uh, for like eight months? How did you find work? Well, there are some variations, but some getting more infestation maybe. Uh, they're doing good and up to six months they start going down. Yeah, some, and then the second one was about um, the egg laying of those uh, insects. Uh, did you get some which managed to lay the eggs, but then the infestation is not as high? Uh, maybe because the, um, the dust has made the eggs dehydrated or something like that. Thank you. Okay. Coming to the first question, I, mean, I think there's a, a big promotion of kernetic storage going on in many African countries. Um, using uh, either the PIX bags, which is sort of like three poly bags together. Erie has also produced a grain throw bag, which is based on kinetic storage. And that, we, we think that is a way to pesticide plants could contribute to that, because you could have your hermetic liner, and around that you could put pesticide plants. So the hermetic liner, of course, would kill any insects that are in the bag already, and then the pesticide plants could stop reinvasion. So I think that's a, a great opportunity to mix technologies in a sustainable way to you know, protect what's in the bag, but also stop that bag from getting reinvested. So I think you know, that's something that I would certainly recommend. When it, when to, your other question about uh, sort of eggs and the effects of these plant materials, there's a lot more work that's been done than what I've shown that shows these different modes of action. So some of these plant materials work by preventing egg laying altogether. Not they didn't show that, but this will, and I'm sure some people here have done trials to show what's called anti -over overposition So the eggs simply won't be laid at all in, in response to these chemicals there. Sometimes it might be oversized, so it actually kills the egg as well. And then, of course, it may stop the, the, the larvae, or larvae from actually burrowing into the seed. So there's a lot of different mechanisms there, which a lot of people here have been working on that. And I think we studied it very well in the, in the laboratory type situation. How that actually works at a farmer's store is not always easily correlated to that. And I think this is where all these other natural environmental conditions really affect the quality of pesticide plants in the storage situation. So humidity or how dry the grain is when it's stored is absolutely critical. And this is something that I don't think we pay enough attention to. If the grain is not properly dry, you are, you're beyond hope already. I think that's the biggest failure that most of the, the biggest struggle that most farmers have, particularly if they're living in a humid environment, is getting their grain dry enough. If they get it dry enough, 
they will have no insect problems, guarantee you. But that is the challenge. So there are technologies to help you drive the grain. I mean, some of it's quite advanced technology, but still at the farmer level, these sort of air bubble dryers, but even just basic solarization, which works very well for things like rootkits, is you put out your, your, I mean, there are videos I can, I can show you that have been designed to help farmers know how to do this. You put down plastic, you put your beans on top of that, you put clear plastic on top of that, and it kills any infestation that's in the seeds already. So I, I caution the use of pesticide plants in post-harvest issues. I know I'm probably going to be quite controversial in saying that because a lot of you I know you're working on post-harvest aspects. But at the farm level, there's so many other confounding factors where pesticide plants just won't help you enough. I think you've got to get focus on a lot of these other conditions first, and then pesticide plants can really help protect historic produce much more effectively. I hope that sort of matches it, but I'm happy to talk to you more about that because there's a lot of complexity in, in making these things work, I think, post harvest. That is the nice mic. Mic on. Okay, Steve, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And as I was listening, I was thinking, I've been thinking about this all afternoon. Now I have a question which is more like a reflection. If you say that in the field trials, you observed that sometimes the yield was good regardless of infestation with the, I mean, of certain level of infestation. I think that when you treat plants with plant extracts, you're also applying my stimulants. And that's something we're finding more and more when we do the phytotoxicity test. Instead of phytotoxicity, we found um, growth improvement for uh, seeds. Sometimes that happens to us. So maybe we have to think in a more holistic point of view and consider that we are biostimulating the plants as a, along with con controlling the pests. I absolutely agree with you. I think there are two elements there. One is that plants can naturally compensate for a level of damage anyway. So if there is some damage to their leaves, to a certain level, it's not going to affect the ultimate yield because they can just compensate. As long as there's good nutrition, they can still have a nice um, sort of optimal yield. And that's something the farmers have picked up and told us themselves, is they believe, when they're, particularly if they're applying this on a weekly basis, they're putting quite a lot of nitrogen and other sort of compounds as a fertilizer starters, but then also what you're, you're talking about I think is also there, and again, there's some good evidence, I think one of the plants that Murray mentioned so far, uh, Flatisons, that is being uh, promoted in China as a biostimulant on tomato production in glass houses because of the, the, the compounds are actually stimul stimulating biochemical pathways in the tomato plants to increase bigger of the plants themselves. So there's lots of elements in there, and I hope we can uh, think about that again as a group, uh, looking at some of these possible biostimulation uh, effects, but also just plain fertilizer. The fact that most of these farmers aren't using much in terms of fertilizer. If you're adding green manure as your pesticide plant on a regular basis, you're also helping just to simply feed the plant. I think in the interest of, interest of time, there are the last two questions, so that Steve can sit down and then we we'll go into general discussions. So the last two questions, yes, and then finally, Thank you for my two comments. One, when I was uh, thinking about the total variable cost vis-a-vis -vis the, the marginal, uh, marginal net return, and the aspect you brought in about the post-harvest handling, especially at the small scale level, again, we find the challenge that uh, it is the private sector which designs some of these packages and the like. That's the way my colleague from Kenya has commented. The, the, the inner core is now where everybody in the streets imitates what has been designed well by the scientists just to get it this way to the, to, to the market and the farmers, which finally now does not really uh, satisfy the farmers' desire to keep their grain much longer. Probably, as we go along this journey, if we can look for a way how universities, research institutions can work directly, although it may involve some issues to do with the lobby, actually we can achieve what we, we want to do along the medicinal plants, so that the element of the, the total cost variable can be reduced in one way or the other. No, no, I totally agree with you, Justice. I mean, that there's 
we, we need to work for and or with farmers, but as well as other stakeholders. I mean, people like you, you're a farmer, but you're also a businessman. And I think that's what we're really lacking, is we need entrepreneurs who are willing to take up some of these aspects and push them. I think government is going to listen to a businessman much more readily than some academic. And that's my experience anyway. So if we get some businesses behind it, think they're willing to take a risk, they want to you know, make some money out of this, but they're going to have to take a risk to develop the, the sort of whole value chain of pesticide plants. We really can't have that better access to the farmers and getting them products that they actually want and can use relatively easily. Last comment? Oh, it's a QC. Um, well, I was wondering again, uh, if you crash on um, Tanakamara, it's mild, it's spicy, does, uh, or do the uh, food commodities uh, at the end of this paper, the smell or... Yeah. Well, that's, actually, yeah, that's one of the reasons, like, one of the other reasons why we want to try this double bag is like, removing the plant material from actually being out next to the grain, we can reduce this possibility of tension. Some things are very well known to change. So you know, using chili, for example, makes it leaves a real residue or garlic. So these are traditional things that the farmers are using for food crops. They also use them for storage. But yes, it does take the grain. There are a lot of farmers who actually just use a kind of oil. So even just like vegetable oil, they'll cut, cook their seed in vegetable oil. That can work quite effectively too. But it can, it can take the grain and reduce its sort of uh, commercial uh, price in the end because there's some sort of discoloration or an odor during the cooking process, that this is, you know, the things that do need to be found out and how you can actually minimize that. So, again, we believe this sort of double bagging is reducing the, the prospects of that changing. Again, we've done trials that actually work with farmers to assess treated grain. Does it still have the same sort of characteristics in those simple senses? Well, thank you, Steve, for your work with the I mean, it's just been a good presentation. And we give you a hand, please. Now it's time for general discussion. This discussion will cover any question concerning any presenter since morning up to now. So if you have a question, you can ask the question here at the second presenter. So all the presenters, they will ask questions if there are any questions. The floor is open. If you have any question, any comment, Yes, right one. Because even 
five boys right to send the MSL as an effect on the parasites. The second thing you need a positive control. Positive control, in other words, that means you need something that you know is effective. The reason for having a positive control is to show whether your model works. If you use if you use Rotomat as a positive control agent, it's fantastic. Uh, and then you need a dosage related effect as well. So you need different dosages to see that the higher the concentration, the better the effect is. Uh, and then what, what bothers me tremendously is that people would say that this plant has antifungal activities. There is no plant that does not have antifungal activities. Let me guarantee you that. We've worked with the leaves of 700 trees and the highest concentration we tested was 2.5 milligrams per liter. And there is not a single one that wasn't active at that stage. But another thing that people want to publish on antioxidant activity. There's no plant, no green plant, I should say, that does not have antioxidant activity. So if you say the plant has antioxidant activity and don't give a figure to that, it is meaningless. If you say it, it, it's got antibacterial activity and you don't give a figure to that, the figure could be out if or if it's, if it's for a bacteria, could be the MIC value. Uh, and the whole literature is absolutely messed totally. Because if you, if you go to the literature, then everybody say, this one, and this one has antibacterial activity. If you don't need figures, it doesn't help. So I think that is your recommendation. If you want to publish your work, make sure when you plan it, you have a negative control, a positive control, and more than one dose. So, and, and if you have a fantastic antioxidant activity, give the figure and compare it to, let's say, for example, um, vitamin C, uh, which is a good standard. If you don't have a standard to compare it with, it means nothing. That was an uh, old professor talking as a university. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I call it Second, if you said, and I know that uh, one of uh, Ari's uh, great uh, additions is to uh, improve the quality of the science that's um, under all of these areas of work, uh, particularly with the reproducibility of results. I mean, one of your big bugbears is where people talk about a single plant species and do an extract and test it. Well, you'd never be able to repeat that. Because you don't know where the plant came from, you don't know what the provenance was, you don't know what the chemistry was at the time, it could have been different one day or the other. John uh, mentioned earlier about the work we're going to talk about tomorrow, we did a bit of work about chemical variation. But if anyone can add chemistry to their research, it will make it much more robust. It's much more, it's much easier to go back to it and understand much more about it. And I don't mean just showing uh, necessarily a figure that shows that there are chemicals there, I mean something much more. Uh, robust about what potentially what chemicals might be causing the effects that you are witnessing. But I would second your um, your plea for people to make their work much more robust. Otherwise, it won't get published and it will get lost. It will just be lost in reports. And Wonderful work is worthless. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I want to add um, on the presentation and comments by Steve. Uh, one, I must say I'm lucky when I was growing up or when I was in college, um, I would always accuse my father that he was in Spain, really lacking leaves around. He did to tell you, know, I'm going to sit here today. Um, yes, the point is, you find that uh, going around the country in Kenya, those four collecting plants are now under ocean, uh, farmers um, are really not uh, very keen. Um, and the one um, approach we use at the National Science of Kenya is the point that we, we need to do as much as possible and quickly record the indigenous knowledge. Uh, we find that uh, most of the plants uh, you know, presented here, um, yes, if we talk of the weeds, we talk of the high value trees, meaning that most of these plants are highly valuable. They have a potential for um, this botanic course. But then, yes, as we do the research, that is disappearing. If the farmers are not able to conduct them, they are not typically using them. And then, yes, besides uh, the religions and us, they enhance the recording of 
the digital economic education. We need to uh, also connect uh, the arts, the commercial aspect. As Julius, we uh, from the MSA, and also the very progress of there. And like that, as I was saying, yes, the research by the scientists, and also the application from the industry will really help us to grow even faster. This is the most important. Because the actual shift 
and it coincidentally has more damage on the cost than on the share of the So again, the, those practices might need to be changed despite their area uh, efficacies. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Yes. I'm listening to what we are talking about. We are now taking the back pesticide to the farmers. I have observed that the farmers there and any with the are I think they are relating the BTC to ignorance and stubbornness. That woman that was uh, spraying with orchids, she did not protect herself, and a lot of the extract must have been on her. She must have taken more than the plants. And the babies, the small children, do the same unprotected. I think now that we are going from the lab with our pesticides to the farm. We should take the farmers along and teach them how to protect themselves. They will resist us. Nobody they will pick up. But in Nigeria, the our own sellers selling brands how we mess. Get into the market to see them with powder. I'm sorry, I'm not telling you what. They are just missing the base in the past. So, when they hands, the whole of the world is filled with the powder. And it's dangerous. But when you ask them, or try to advise them, they say they have been doing it for five years, no problem. Because they don't know the problem. I don't uh, see a bit immediate as we are. We are only conscious of acute toxicity, not chronic. And these things go into the system and cause chronic poison. So we should be we should take them along. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, this is the last question or comment. I would like to find the organizers.
Um, so we are, we are, we are starting uh, at Eric. Um, for those who are staying uh, down there in the National Parks, uh, please, can you, can you please uh, see Gary Emmanuel? Okay, stand up, please. You can see this, uh, this gentleman. Um, for some, uh, and also those who are staying at Denmark. We need to do uh, some uh, arrangements there. Then for the hard work, there's the work today. At 7 p.m., we are meeting in a room called Alumnu. Uh, there, we'll see whether you can learn or not. Uh, there's, a, there's a small room there, there's a cocktail that uh, uh, Oxford organized for you also. Uh, if you can find yourself, it's actually, it is you go around the steps and heading for the reception, you'll see it on your right. It's labeled Kalundu. Kalundu. So, don't the date. It's also a time, no, no, it's okay, it's also a time to network and get to really catch the knowledge and say, right, what? No, I didn't have the... Because sometimes you're shy and you know it's difficult. Even uh, I, I, you know, I was actually going to give our farmers a chance to, uh, maybe, maybe tomorrow, first day, because we, we know that sometimes it can be very difficult to, to communicate, but uh, I think uh, if you have any questions, um, if you have any questions, we need more of your questions. We, we need you to challenge all these scientists and demand for, you know, services deliver, because you are the masters of all this work. At the end of the day, it's because of you. So we we would appreciate if you have any issues that have not been uh, answered or that you couldn't follow because you know we talk about sometimes we get carried away with the chemistry, yeah? uh, only a lot of that. And sometimes you might get very basic lessons, and maybe it might be difficult. So um, push your person through to to him, and then maybe. We can we can hear we can give you a priority that uh, five minutes tomorrow. Otherwise, uh, um, I will go one more request uh, for the international organizing committee. Can you please uh, remain behind for a quick discussion together with uh, the local organizing committee? Just uh, you know, for a few minutes, so we can quickly. Right, tomorrow's talks. Make sure that they are they are not a waste. You see that gentleman. Make sure that uh, you have all your talks with him, so that tomorrow we don't fumble around. Alright, thank you very much. Uh, See you on the next call. Thank you. So, of course, uh, we well, are very international parts. You can meet here yeah, and go to uh, 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 anyone who can ask me for uh, just a very short time. Uh, thank you.